I wanted to talk to you guys today about how to tune a gravity flyer. So I have a theory on this and I'm just going to come out and say it. He's using acoustical resonance. So what do I mean by that? He's using the sound of everything to tune the rest of the project. So when you have two discs and they wobble like this and they create a sound, that sound right there is acoustically resonant to all the rest of the parts. So when this one acts like this, the next one will start to act in the same manner. And then the third one will act in the same manner as well. They are all acoustically resonant to each other. So let's look at that a little more in depth. We have two plates right here. And as they run around in the circles, they wobble and make a sound. Now, when you get the motors in tune, the actual look on your oscilloscope, they will actually cross over each other, just like that. They cross over each other, then they come back, then they cross over each other again. They are resonant to each other. When they are harmonizing, between doing that, they're actually right where you want them. Now, what happens next? Then you turn on the Tesla coil. The co Tesla coil now has to become acoustically resonant to the two discs. You do not have a value set on your Tesla coil. As you put the wire down in the top of the Tesla coil and you can control the up and down of the wire to control the frequency. Now you're not using the full frequency of the Tesla coil, you're just using a portion of it. Where it falls is exactly where the frequency is. So you tune that up and down along with the power on the Tesla coil. What does that do? If it's making a ringing noise and you know that you got that with the two discs ringing, you now have acoustic resonance. Now, you take the ultrasound machine, it now has to also be acoustically resonant to the other two items, the two discs and now the Tesla coil. The Tesla coil goes into the center plate, don't forget that. That right there, those three discs together are acoustically resonant to one another. The ultrasound is now hooked to the top of the machine. You're going to make that acoustically resonant to the other. You're going to make it all fall within that same pattern. Most people look at an oscilloscope and they see the lines and they want them just to, let's hit that button to make them match. Well, this is kind of the same way. I say it like it's braiding hair. You're actually intertwining each one. One over the other, over the other, over the other. As they do that, they hit a point where they spike. Why? Because they all meet at the same place. That's when you get your spike. Now the energy coming from that is now greater than the sum of its parts. So you say, I have a value here for the uh, ultrasound, I have a value here for a testicle, I have a value here for the energy going in to the two plates. Well, it's not an accumulation of that energy can give you the answer to it. It's what they make together. It's the fact that they all come together at one point and the energy spikes. That's the point where you need to look for it. This is the understanding of how to tune this thing. Now, there's individual parts here, and there's other things to look for. What exactly are they looking for when they put out that little uh, gravitation machine? You see the two sides and the one. Let me bring you back to an experiment that I did. When you rotate a magnet, you can take that, uh, excuse me, multimeter, and you can hold it up like this. What you're going to get with a rotating magnet is you're going to get a reading from that multimeter. It's going to read right into your multimeter. A analog one is better than a digital when you go to do this. I have done it with a digital. It'll still give you it to it. In my rotating magnet experiment, I used a coil of wire. As the magnet rotated, the coil of wire energized. So I can tell where energy is throughout an individual process or distance. Each one has a different value. Now, 
when you have that rotating magnetic field, what are you getting? You're just getting charges. So whether it's positive, negative, at this point it really doesn't matter. You're getting charges. So what happens to that meter? It starts to spike. I didn't realize this, but I actually did this on my gravity flyer. I was looking for the same thing. I was looking for that energy to pull up. So I actually used the same thing. I went over to it. What's the problem with this? Sometimes in the gravity flyer, because of the actual magnet, they're shielded by metal. So when they're shielded by metal, you don't get anything on the outside of it. It's a directed straight up. So you're going to have to put the little uh, parts right there. Now, because the gravity flyer itself is getting energy put into it, you're going to get, when everything's on, a complete field of energy. So, hopefully that starts to make sense to you. What is he looking for? He's just looking for the energy to come up. So, he knows it's there. That's what you're looking for in that multimeter. That's why he does this. So, he shows you that the Tesla coil is on. You turn on the light. He shows you that on your gravity flyer, the energy there is there as well. But now, if you pulse it, you can get spikes. And you can see that it's working properly. You are looking for those spikes. Pushing energy out just like this. You're looking for that spike. That's the whole reason for it. I didn't understand it until I went back through all my experiments and saw exactly what I was looking at. This is what he's looking for. This is the result I got when I hooked up the same multimeter. That's all that he's looking for. He's not over there to put things on top of things and measure them. It's basically, is the energy getting in the air? That's what it is. We all know that the Tesla coil will do it, but the way he hooks up his Tesla coil is not the way that you would normally hook it up. Let me tell you the difference in his Tesla coil when he hooks it up. If you put the wire to the Tesla coil, if I hook it to the number two, or if I hook it to the number one coil, either one, the Tesla coil now becomes part of the circuit. But if I hang the wire inside the hole of the Tesla coil, and the number two coil right there, if I just drop it in, it is now independent of that circuit. We, or I, have been guilty of hooking it directly to the Tesla coil. What happens? I blow MOSFETs like crazy because it cannot handle the energy spikes that are given to it. Yet, if I took that wire and just dropped it down in there, what happens? The energy spike can dissipate in the air and not go directly into the circuit. That's the difference. It can actually pull the energy from the circuit, but it's independent of the circuit. Therefore, it doesn't blow the MOF set. It's one of our biggest struggles in this. A lot of people don't understand that. He uses a heavier MOF set. This thing is like from a tube TV. This thing is a lot bigger and a lot stronger. 300 volts, 6 volt gate, basically easy trigger, and then a very high amount of power. But he's not putting that much power into it. He's using 12 volt DC battery to put it into it. I will say this, watch how this works. Every circuit has the ability to pull more energy than what the value of the circuit is. If the value of the circuit is 12 volts, understand this, it can pull up to the value of the battery it's connected to. Therefore, the energy can be much greater than you anticipate, especially if he's not coupling the circuit to blow the circuit itself. He is now putting the wire on top. Now he can pull the full energy of the battery itself along with the resonating Tesla coil in order to get the energy to spike way up. He's getting a bigger value out of the spike. But what happens when you have an acoustic resonance going on in your circuit? It can now make a moment where things are blown out in energy and now it needs to replace that same amount of energy in a very instant it immediately wants to do that. So it's going to draw more power than what you think because it's expending all this energy. 
the amount of power it takes to refill that amount is the amount of power that you know you just created. Therefore, the amount of the energy created is greater than the sum of its parts because you now have created something that's expanding that energy out versus what the actual circuit is. This is the understanding you're going to need to know. It's very important in this. I can't explain it well enough. It is not just a sum of the value of the parts. It is a expansion of that. It's a Townsend effect. It will multiply. It will be a runaway effect. Therefore, the energy that is pulled out at one time has to be replaced and replenished so you'll get a spike in your Tesla coil going in. Everybody knows when you get spikes in circuits, they tend to blow up. Mine actually turn on fire and start to burn everything down. But when you don't couple them together and it's independent, you can get away with energy spikes. That's why he's doing it. So how is the tuning going? Let's get back to that. If I tune these two discs right here to a radio frequency, say I want to look up 500 a.m. on my radio. I now know at 500 a.m. I can go a little bit below and a little bit over, but I am in that tunnel. I cannot go to the outside of that tunnel. I am directly in that tunnel right there. So how do you tune the radio, or excuse me, how do you tune the gravity flyer to the radio? You know where your tunnel is. So all you have to do is tune the two discs to the tunnel. Then you tune the you tune the Tesla coil to the same tunnel. Then you tune your acoustic frequency up here in your ultrasound to the same tunnel. All of it runs in that tunnel on the AM radio. Hopefully now you're starting to get the understanding. You hit hear bits and parts here and there of individual things. How do they run together? Right in that tunnel. The braiding effect. Just like this. Braid it. Braid it. Come together. Hit a spike. Energy expands in the Townsend effect. That's how he's doing it. He can hear the sound of each thing interacting with the other. For those of you who know, don't know this out there, I actually wear hearing aids. Not because I can't hear necessarily. I'm tone deaf. I cannot hear my son's voice. All of it's muffled. It sounds like one thing. It's being filtered out. What I can hear is actual noise like ambulances and things like that that have a real sharp tone to them. I can hear them at 10 times the level other people do. They hurt my ears. They hurt so much. But I can't hear certain things. So I have trouble tuning my hearing aids because I have to get that bass sound up and remove the trouble sound. So when I tune things, I generally tune them to the sound of things. So I understand what he's doing. When he puts a sound in there, he's looking for a sound here. When he gets this on the same frequency, it'll tune with the same sound. It'll start making a sound here where it didn't before. And you'll have the sound here where it didn't before, before you started turning them. Now you get the ultrasound in there. It's adding to the sound. Again, we're going right in that AM lane right there. We're staying right around, what do you say, 500? We're staying right there. We're going a little bit to the sides, but we're all braiding in the same effect in that tunnel. That's what he's doing. It's the understanding of this. It takes a while to walk yourself through each process to get there. But if all the facts are telling you that, then you can build a math problem on this. So, how do you do that? Well, I'm not going to try to tell you how to do the math, but I'm giving you the figures right now. You have one, two, three. Now you're going to put them all together, and you're going to make it. One thing I will tell you about this, though, remember he's creating energy in the device. He's breaking the gravity with energy. We live in a static world. 
we go and rub our feet on the on the carpet down the hall to shock our brother and sister and laugh our butts off well we're creating static charge which means static charge is in the air the accumulation of static charge what does it do I did an experiment on this we take aluminum foil and we stick it to wood based on that charge we are polarizing something with charge if you tell me that we're in you know a North Pole well we go the opposite of that and we're repulsing against it if we are on the south we got to do the same there it's an understanding of how all of it works so you could say acoustic resonance along with magnetic fields along with static charge you could start throwing out all the names you want but it's very simple if the man is telling you exactly how he tunes it and he's tuning it by his ear that means that every time you hit the right frequency you're going to get another one where it's going to start singing to you because it's in the right frequency why does it tune when, tune when you put on an am radio because he's going down the same lane all of these things on your oscilloscope you can't see them in 3d but they're braiding they're braiding and when they hit together boom they hit a spike anyway i hope you guys understand this, this is the understanding i have it's the way i will tune this thing and i'll get it done by ear before i put it on my oscilloscope because I really do understand what it is. Anyway, hopefully you understood this. If not, ask the questions, I'll answer them. And if you like what you saw here today, please like and subscribe. Thank you very much. Have a great day.